I realized, oh my God, I don't know my stuff. I don't have any product knowledge. I was, I, I knew one or two phrases, but it really didn't. I, I really did botch up. And then when you've got big Cujo's dogs chasing after you. <laughs> and in America, I found that they, they either have one dog or three dogs. Um, so when you've got Cujo running after you, and I did have a Cujo running after me, um, and barking like a really big one. <laughs> and then you sit, and another time you sit down to have a lunch break and you hear a rattlesnake come closer and closer. I thought, okay, it's time to go back. So being in business on your own is a bit like being chased by three big dogs and also having to face rattlesnakes all over the place. So this is a great opening and metaphor to Harun's interview, which is absolutely filled with fantastic and interesting messages, learnings, gifts and challenges along the way of Harun, you know, finding his journey to what he's doing today. We agreed at the end that this is only going to be part one. There is going to be a part two where we're going to delve into a little bit deeper in terms of what Harun is doing today, which is all around the art of decision making. Anyway, enjoy part one and see what you think. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Harun. How are you today? Michael, I am absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for asking. <laughs> I would not expect anything less from you, Harun. <laughs> it's, uh, hey, I'm alive and that's good enough for me. Absolutely. And it's kind of dry today-ish, bit cloudy, so it's still OK. Yeah, it's still OK because the sun is still shining uh, yes. above the clouds, but it's still there. It's still there. It will be mm -hmm. there for quite a while. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm really delighted to speak to you. I want to learn and find out what's been going on with you. But before we go into the kind of hearing what you're doing today, I, I will start with the same question, which is for you to share a little bit about your personal life. Where were you born? A bit about your education, where you now live. Um, if you want to share stuff about your family, that's fine, but you don't have to. So over to you. Well, uh, where was I born? Well, first of all, I'm a Brummy, but I wasn't born in Birmingham. And right. I'm a posh Brummy because I've changed my accent. <laughs> uh, I was born in the country at the time was called East Pakistan. Um, a few decades earlier, it was India. Yeah. And then at the time I was born, it was East Pakistan in 69. And then within two years of my, well, in fact, a year and a half later, we entered into civil war in that particular country. Um in fact, the figures are staggering. There were the highest figures are about three million people massacred at that time. And um, during that time, my mum was also pregnant the entire duration of the war. I, 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 I bet you didn't expect this one. No. Now, why, why I bring this up is a lot of people talk about, remember probably, you know, especially slightly older people, not that old, um, about the Rwandan massacre the, where there was a million people who were massacred in mm. Bangladesh. It was East Pakistan at the time. Three, uh, three million people massacred. The lowest figures, obviously, by the invading party is about 300,000. Uh, but the numbers were quite high. So I, I grew up, I was born in a very difficult period and uh, came to the UK, Birmingham, actually, in 1974 um, with my mom and my little sister. Um, she, well, she was little at the time and she's still my little sister. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so grew up in Birmingham, but we moved around a lot. Um, my father... My father was on a, um, wasn't educated. He was orphaned at a very young age. So he was self-taught. And in Bangladesh, when you're orphaned, you know, uh, unless you're lucky to be in an orphanage, you literally it's a village that raised you and you have to fend for yourself. Yeah. So he wasn't educated. And so he he wanted to better himself. So when we came to this country, he used to work in fact, factories. It was called Perry Bomb Metals, metal bashing and all that kind of mm. stuff. Um, so... And then by 1980, we he'd, and in fact, it was 79, he decided to open up a grocer's store of all the lovely places, Oldham. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we moved to Oldham. And uh, thankfully, we were only there, sorry, Oldham people, but thankfully, we were only there six months because at that time, the... Um, it was the first time I experienced racism. I'd never, I mean, when I say experience, I've, I've known about it, mm. about the National Front. I've seen them live, etc. 
But I was only nine at the time in 79, and some guy hurled some rab- racist abuse, an adult, mm-hmm. and spat at me. And I, This is the first time I thought, hold on, I haven't done anything wrong. Mm. What, why, why did he just spit at me? Why is he calling me these names? So that was, so anyway, six months after moving to Oldham, we moved back to Birmingham. My dad got another job and that was in 1980. And then a year later, he thought, okay, well, hold on. The Indian curry business is flourishing. Let me open up a takeaway somewhere where there's nobody around. And he opened up a takeaway. So we were in Birmingham at the time Wow, in Sunderland. You know, sun, sea, sand, and plenty of wind and rain. Sunderland. So, Sunderland, yeah. Now, he opened it up with two of the partners. None of them knew how to cook, but he was an entrepreneurial you know, endeavor, mm. and one of his cousins encouraged him. And the business did quite well for a while. It was in a very competitive area uh, on a road called Hilton Road, and there was like 20 other Indian takeaways. And it, that road isn't that big. Um, and <laughs> one of the partners, he saw that, the bank balance. They thought, wow, that looks, that's amazing. This is in um, early 81 now. And uh, he decided, oh, no, 82, I should say. He decided, I wonder, or he thought, I wonder what it would look like in my bank balance, in my bank account. So he literally took the money out, fled the country. Um, One of the other partners walked out. He said, look, I've lost everything. And my father had a choice. He had a choice of working, um, trying to turn this business around Mm. because they had debts as well. Obviously, it's a business or or, or go bankrupt. And he decided to uh, keep the takeaway. And what he did was he had to get rid of it. Most people, he kept one cook um, and then he shipped us from Birmingham. So now there's six of us kids. So they've been busy (laughs) in the interim period. Six of us kids. I'm 12. My youngest is six. Youngest is maybe two, three months old. I'm my mom. So we all came up. My mom worked in the takeaway at the back with my dad. Um, she helped on the on the kind of side. My dad was a bit of a cook, not that good, really. And um, that's how it all started, really. So, you know, wow. to answer one of the questions you're probably going to be asking is, what was your first job? That was my first job. My job yes. was to serve customers. Oh. My cust- customers would come in and... Uh, they would order, it was literally just order taking, that was the early days, and it was also advertising, so all I did was, I saw in the local papers, which is the Sunderland Echo, um, how other takeaways advertised, and we just copied, I just copied and pasted, we did adverts with a picture of our own takeaway at the front, or a picture of a tandoori chicken, actually, at the front, yes. um, so, um, so my job was advertising, totting up the, you know, end of uh, evening bills, etc., and uh, taking custom orders. My mum and my dad served at the back. Now, don't get me wrong, I hated my job. Oh, uh, don't get me wrong, I didn't choose to. And how um, old were I, you when you're doing that? I was 12. I was 12. I started 12. at the age of 12. Yeah, I was just about to turn 13. Uh, this is November 1982. Channel 4 had just come out. Mm. I remember <laughs> all the black and white movies. Um, and so straight after school, so it would be about 5.30, Monday to Thursday, I'd start working and I'd finish on average 11, 11.30. And then, now we used to live above the takeaway. So you can imagine living in a place where I'm the only person of color. Well, there was a Chinese guy, but, you know, uh, even his our Chinese biology teacher thought he was a reverse Reverse boiled egg, yellow, <laughs> yellow on the outside, white on the, oh, white on wow. the inside. I've never heard so he, that before. He, yeah, that, that was a Chinese person talking about another Chinese person. Yes. But anyway, so I was the only person of colour in that school. So you can imagine uh, being the only person of colour in a school, in a town where, remember, 1982, I don't know if you were, I don't think you were here, were you? 1982, yes, I we was. Had, oh, you was? Okay, yes. well, Margaret Thatcher in power. Yes. Coal miners strike, shipbuilders. Yes. Like Sunderland used to be the biggest shipbuilders, shipbuilders in the world. And... Um, they that was shut uh, all the coal mines had started shutting and the union strikes so you can imagine the labor force weren't the most educated and mm-hmm. uh, yes yeah, so the language was very colorful let's put it this way both at the takeaway even though they were ordering from us yes. and um also at school so that that that, that was the, that was the big challenge and mm-hmm. the reason i worked was there was nothing else I could do, you know. You know, I was had to help the family. I didn't have a choice. Uh, is it a matter, you know? Like, I mean, if there was choice, or at that age, if there was choice, I would have chosen something different. But you know what? I hated it, but it, it was the thing that planted the seeds of success for later on. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's always a reason, isn't there? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and were you going to school as well? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to school, um, usual schooling hours, 8.30 in the morning, start, 3.30, finish. By the time I'd get home, it'd be about 4 o'clock. I'd do my homework, have a have a sandwich, um, have about 10 minutes rest, and 5.30, clean, you know, like clean up the windows, hoover the floor, et cetera, and open up the takeaway. Um, Fridays, we used to start at, so weekdays except friday we start at 5 30 and friday we start at five mm. i used to finish at 11 11 30 but friday and saturday nights um i used to finish at 2 33 in the morning and that was literally sitting in the front waiting for people to come in um mm. it wasn't that busy of a takeaway so which made it worse because yes. that means boredom yes you know so yeah so i did go to school and i worked wow time. wow so what what happened after that then how long were you doing that for well, the business could only sustain itself with, you know, untrained people for maybe a couple of years, I think 81, 82, 83, so two years. And then it shut down. And at that point, obviously, my life was resembled something of a normality. It didn't because I was working again, but mm. this time working for somebody else's takeaway, uh, Friday, Saturday nights. Uh, I mean, there was less pressure now because, you know, uh, it wasn't seven days a week. Yes. And um, I worked there and then I worked in restaurants and up to the age of 18, um, it's been primarily studying and working. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I did yeah. for a long time. I have to say afterwards, I yes. did for a long time because it felt like the childhood was just taken away. Yes. Um, didn't had a couple of mates but we didn't do anything together we were living in severe poverty conditions um quite dreadful actually but you know when you're living in those conditions you don't realize how bad the conditions are until you know you've moved away from those conditions and you think oh my god did i actually live like that mm. yeah i did yeah yeah and so at what stage did you finish your education? What did you do with that? You know, what were you interested in, not interested in? Well, I, so the teachers at school, the A-level teachers, the O-level teachers, they all thought um, this guy really understands biology and sciences. And they all thought, yep, you need to study medicine. Of course, being of uh, Asian origin, uh, <laughs> the first thing they think is, you know, you, they, they tell you, your parents, etc. cetera, uh, you're going to be a lawyer, accountant or doctor, uh, yes. a lad. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, so they were all headed, pushing me towards the, um, the doctor direction. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I, I did my O-levels, but then at that time there was a lot of, um, breakdown i mean our family was properly disenfranchised but between the age of 16 and 18 it was going to pot big time and um i, I and also during those days uh, even though i was heading towards medicine i i used to watch the news you know and uh, quite regularly and on the news was junior doctor works 120 hour week without a break etc and i thought oh, yeah. my goodness <laughs> you know why the hell would i work so hard yes. make all that money and not have a moment to spend it yes <laughs> you know um and, and so you've been there I, already you've done yeah, that <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and um so I, I just lost interest and i lost heart and i really didn't know what to do and at the time a massive influencer was my parents were you know unfortunately they weren't that educated uh, at all mm. and they uh, they wanted to arrange my sister's wedding and she was only 16 and and she was and i won't bring it up because i don't think she's given me permission to talk about it but she had endured some terrible terrible experiences uh, from a family member uh, not family member family friend sorry yes. and um, that was coming to the fore so that just totally knocked me off tilted but by the time i was 18 i left home sunderland that is and i moved back to birmingham moved in my uncle and started doing my a-levels again and eventually eventually long story short after doing um, economics and maths i Ended up, this is part-time now, working full-time during the day, study. I reversed the roles during the day. I just, first time I just thought about that. I, during the day, I was working full-time, and now evenings, I was doing evening classes, maths and yes. economics, and I ended up doing an economics degree. The work I was doing was working in stockbroking. Um, so, yeah, so economics degree, and then everything just shifted um, for me because during the – I've always wanted to go to America. Yes. And after the first year, towards the end of the first year, there was this company called the Southwestern Company who basically hired graduates to go to America, different parts of America, go knocking on door to door selling basically encyclopedias. And that wasn't what attracted me. And that was, to me, I just thought ah, an opportunity to go to America so and, and to make a bit of money as well. So I went to America and 
during the first week of training in Nashville, Tennessee, it was amazing. The weather. Now, bearing in mind, I grew up in Britain, and then suddenly you got sun starting very early in the morning. You know, sunrise at six o'clock, and it's hot. Yes. I mean, we have sunrise here in the UK at six as well. <laughs> I don't mean like that. I mean, the weather was hot. Yeah. You can swim outside in the swimming pool and so on. And uh, I was more interested in the parties and the girls, uh, to be honest. So I didn't. This is sales training week, and so once I got into the job, which was knocking on door to door. First door you knock on, 7.59 a.m., and you continue till 6. Um, I realized, oh, my God, I don't know my stuff. I don't have any product knowledge. I was, I, I knew one or two th- phrases, but it really didn't. I, I really did botch up. And then when you've got big Cujo's dogs chasing after you. <laughs> and in America, I found that they, they either have one dog or three dogs. Um, so when yes. you've got Cujo running after you, and I did have a Cujo running after me, um and barking like a really big one (laughs) and then you sit and another time you sit down to have a lunch break and you hear a rattlesnake come closer and closer i thought okay it's time to go back (laughs) (laughs) so this is the i was in michigan doing this and i started flint michigan of all places oh god Uh, yeah, that place. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I headed back on a, on a bus back to New York to then eventually fly back to the UK. And on on the way back, this is a pivotal moment for me. On the way back, I was I was reading the books that I should have read. So it's most, some of the motivational books, and I started listening to the tape. Yes, cassettes, um, the motivational cassette. And there was a guy by the name of Mort Utley, and Mort Utley. Um, was a phenomenal motivational speaker. And I thought, oh, my goodness, number one, I could have really made some serious amounts of money for a student. Mm. Number two, I want to be like that when I grow up. I want to be a speaker. I don't want to talk about sales as well. Um, I mean, once I get the experience. So I actually wanted to be a motivational speaker. And it was that was at the age of 22, um, Probably, yeah, 10 years later, I actually set up my own company, which ended up being me primarily speaking. So education, economics degree. So, oh, yes, I, I, I never did finish that story, did I? So it came back to the UK and I thought, you know, I'm not going to be a stockbroker. I'm going to get myself a sales job. And this is interesting, Michael, because a lot of people, it's like dating. They get too serious about it. And it's like when you're looking for a job, I thought to myself, OK, I'm going to get myself a medical sales job. I want it from a job that's advertised in the Sunday Times. I, I don't know, random, right? So lo and behold, I, I, I applied for some jobs and I got married as well, by the way. Just thought throw that in straight after <laughs> okay. university. Yeah, semi-arranged marriage. But anyway, <laughs> I, I started looking for a job and um, I went through a few interviews, etc. Now, one job I got was uh, I got uh, accepted for this company, which was a sales job, and it was selling timeshares. So I this has never happened to me, but on the morning of going to the job, I woke up at, quite early, but uh, about 8 o'clock in the morning, I was vomiting like crazy. I thought, what the hell is happening to me? Oh, my God. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not nervous. I'm no. slightly nervous. I, I, I'm not, you know, there's no food poisoning or anything like that. I mean, come on, when you're used to eating curry, nothing can, you know, yes. upset your stomach. Yes. <laughs> so, so I thought, what was going on? And what happened was I turned down a terrible situation. I didn't realize until later. I thought, that, that's my body, my intuition at some level, my body intuition telling me, this is not for you, Buster. You, mm. you can't go. And so a couple of months later, I did find a job via the Sunday Times. And um, it was working for a company called Olympus Kemet. And that was selling medical equipment. Now, what was interesting was that I'd been to a few interviews and I didn't like some of the jobs that came my way. And I thought, well, the Kemet interview, I was in Manchester and there was 270 people for this one position. There were five positions um, nationwide, but for this one position, there was about 270 people uh, being interviewed. And we sat there at this Grand Hotel or something. And uh, I think it was called the Grand Hotel. And um, these other students all dressed, dressed up in fine suits, talking like, you know, yes, I got a first in English. And, you know, they were, they were talking about their grades amongst each other. And I thought, shit. So sorry, kids might be listening. <laughs> I was thinking... Right, I've got a Desmond, a tutu. So, <laughs> as in a tutu, not a two-one. Um, and so, I got no chance. So I thought to myself, I'm going to treat this as a practice run. 
So they gave us individual, small groups, little presentation, group presentations, and then they walked us along the corridor individually to have a one-to-one interview for five minutes. I thought, mm. what the heck am we, are we going to talk about in five minutes? Mm. So the I didn't know that. The, actually, I did. National sales manager picked me. It was my turn. And as he was walking along the corridor, as we were walking along the corridor, I asked him questions like, so how long have you been with the company? So, um, what keeps you here, you know, if you've mm. been there that long? Mm. And uh, what's your... So I started interviewing him. Yes. Uh, it was very consciously done. And then we sat down. And again, I had loads of questions. They had probably only one or two questions of me. Mm. I had loads of questions on them. That was it. Out of all the 270 people, I was the only one who, put, who was put through to the next level. Wow. And, you know, only one who obviously clearly got the job amongst them. So... This is not really trying to impress people, but it's to impress upon them that treat every opportunity with fun, treat it like fun, but treat it like a practice run as well. Do your best. Always do your best, but treat it like a practice and let go of any, you know, I mean, I had in my mind, I had no choice. I thought, I ain't getting this job. It wasn't an attitude. I just thought, I'm not going to get this job. I have 270 people. They're all much more. They're, they're, they're posh to start off with. They got top grades, and there's just little old me. And um, so, you know, and the reason they picked me was very simple. The manager told me afterwards, I got a few other interviews, a few other stages of interviews. They said, Harun, you're the only one who actually was interested in us. You asked us yes. questions. Yes. Isn't that well, interesting? I, I like what you just said, and I, I don't want to go past it that quickly is what you said is use every opportunity as like a practice session yes and detach yourself from the outcome or what the expectation absolutely so just and and the bit about having fun just just have fun yeah make it a practice session and detach from what outcome might happen yes and who knows what might happen right <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And every and opportunity thing. is a practice session. I love that. I've never heard I, anybody say that before. Well, what's interesting was that was a mentality I had because I, one piece I, maybe I should throw in there because it's relevant is at the age of 14 when I was still working at my takeaway, there was a uh, there was an advert in the New Sunday Echo, some Sunderland Echo, I should say, for about a new Kung Fu class starting. Now, knowing my dad, my dad was very tough and very, you know, aggressive, etc. And, you know, he, he was a Victorian type of yes. father, you know, who just was uh, born one century late. Yes. And um, he, like, be seen and not heard, that kind of thing. So there's this Kung Fu school opening, and I, and I knew he was a Bruce Lee fan because he used to, I used to hear him talk about it. So I thought, look, there's a Kung Fu school opening. Can I go? And a lot of people ask me, well, did you do it because you want to learn how to fight? No, I had a heck of a temper, and that used to get me through fights. Um, did, you, because, did you do it because of fitness? I don't know, why? I'm 14. Why would I want to be fit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I did it because I wanted to get the heck out of the takeaway. But what that martial arts did was, you know, it taught me that even in competition, it's practice. The ones that I, all the competitions that I won, I treated it like a practice run. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Okay, so back to to where we were. So so you got the job mm -hmm. um, against all odds, basically two hundred and seventy people against you, and then then what were you doing? Well, in that company. So you know how I tried to escape being a doctor. Yes. No. Well, the medical uh, world had different ideas. So the company I was working for was selling endoscopic equipment. Um, bums and tums, basically tubes up your backside yes. and down your throat and so on. And I used to sell. So our company, Olympus, were the global leaders in that field. However, they had a division, a new one, relatively new one, only a year old, which is called endotherapy, selling the biopsy forceps, injection needles, etc. Mm. And we had, we had, um, we had probably the lowest market share, even though the company was well known. We just weren't known for that. So my job was basically to look after a territory and build it. So um, um, I, it, first six months, uh, I basically got, I was on the brink of getting sacked so many times because the company's attitude was throw enough mud and some of it will stick. In other words, keep on talking to your customers about all the different products and eventually somebody will buy. And I thought, well, throw enough mud. I don't want to get my hands dirty. So <laughs> I, I, now, being somebody with an economics background, I thought, okay, Pareto optimality, 80-20 rule, 80% of all the businesses are going to come from 20% of the clients, customers. Who are they? 
I identified them. And the other thing I noticed, this is so important, again, thinking way out of the box, which I'm hoping uh, our listeners will truly get to grips with. Now, I watched all the top salespeople within our company, and I noticed there's a big difference between the top guys and the ones who are further down, mm. and which is this, that the ones that were further down were known as the key med rep, Olympus key med, key med rep, or the sales rep, or the medical rep. And the ones at the very top, the top performers were known by their first name. So my strategy was I want to be known by my first name by 80% of my customers. What does that mean? That means they know me, they like me, they trust me, they're very familiar with me. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't anything, I didn't analyze it. I just thought mm, top guys seem to be known by their first name. I want to be like the top guy. Yes. That's it. I was just modeling them. Yes. And as a result, so the first six months took a while um, to get the business in, my colleagues were getting quite a bit of business in. And then all of a sudden I started, you know, I had a lot of memos saying, Arun, you know, there's going to be a disciplinary hearing on the way. You need to you know, get the results in. You need to demonstrate more, et cetera. So I was building relationships rather than demonstrating products. I'd occasionally mention products. Mm. And then all of a sudden, instead of getting a 200-pound order or a 400, 500-pound order, which is what average or most people are getting, I got a 10,000-pound order. And then all of a sudden, one of my other colleagues got a twelve thousand pound order. You know, he's a good friend of mine, Mark. And um, and then I thought, okay, I've got to beat him. I'm, I'm kind of competitive. I went for fifteen thousand, then twenty five thousand, and some guy caught up with twenty thousand. I thought, I better get a higher one, forty eight thousand. And I was getting the biggest orders in the company's history, time and time again. And it was all about relationships. Mm -hmm. People buy from people they know, like, and trust. And in my mind. I didn't see myself as a salesperson. I saw myself as an assistant buyer. What do I mean by that? It's like a personal assistant. I help them to make buying choices. And okay, albeit they're going to buy from me, but I help them. At the same time, I also help them go and make decisions against products that we had as well. Because there are certain products which weren't good. And I'll say, right, get it from the competition. Yes. And as a result, the trust just exponentially amplified. So as an entrepreneur, one of the things I've you know, emphasize big time is building trust. Yeah. Trust can, sometimes it can be built within minutes. Sometimes it takes years, but your aim should be building trust. If you build trust, they know you, they like you, then they trust you. They will engage with you. If they, if you don't have trust and you've got something that they need, they might engage with you, but as soon as the competition appears, that's it. Now I left that company four years later to become a headhunter. And when I left, um, even a year or so after I'd left my territory, what would happen was my competition hated me because I'd sold so much, I saturated the territory with our products. So we, uh, I built a territory with about £90,000 order a year. Within four years, we built it to, well, I built my territory to, when I say we, I mean we as a company. Sure. But I was the only person dealing in that territory. Yeah. We built it three, to three quarters of a million pounds, which to me is, I mean, oh God, uh, such an amazing feeling to be able to transform an entire group of hospitals. We're talking about 120 hospitals in that period of time. Yeah. Brilliant, man. Fantastic. So that that must have you know, from everything that you've been through previously, that must have really boosted your confidence in terms of what you were able to achieve out there. It, it did boost my confidence. And uh, don't get me wrong, I was never cocky, um, never a push. I was actually very introverted, believe it or not. I know you know me on a social side. Mm. I'm actually, at the time, especially at my childhood, I was very introverted. Now, when you're with doctors, medical doctors who've trained 10, 20 years. So I'm talking about, I dealt with senior consultants and um, big time decision makers. They know their stuff. Yes. So I actually, and also their geniuses in what they do. So the biggest thing I learned was being silent, asking good questions and listening. Same in martial arts. In martial arts, the best fighters aren't the ones who are constantly throwing punches left, right and center. It's just that one blow which does the trick. And that could you could say that with um, people like Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, Muhammad Ali, certainly Tyson. You know, it's just out of nowhere you've got this one killer blow. And it's the same here. It's not about in in business. It's not about a killer blow. It's about that 
key turning point where you transform that relationship. And that comes from listening. Very, very good advice. How long were you doing that for then, Harun? So I did, I, I did, um, I worked for that company for four years. I got headhunted to be a headhunter in London. So I moved, I was living in Leeds at the time. And um, my, I'd, I'd been married four years and my son was only about four months old. So we got, we moved to London and I ended in a, in a job. And I, you know, here's a massive learning lesson, which is a very painful experience because it had many consequences. So I was on 50K, 50,000 a year, approximately. Uh, company car, beautiful house, very little mortgage, and um, in, in a suburb of Leeds. And I said to myself, self, if you ever go to London, because I'd heard about London jobs, if you ever move to London, it's got to be because the money's 25 grand more. Well, this company offered me smaller basic and a commission which would have turned to, taken me to minimum 90, 100,000 pounds. Mm. And I... And that's the only reason I changed jobs. It was for the money. Sure. I was on great money. I wasn't on good money. I was on great money at the time. Uh, this is in the year 2000. But when I ended in the job, I, I really should have do, done my due diligence. A, there's a heck of a lot of competition in recruitment. B, they wanted you not to use your own name uh, because we were headhunters as opposed to just recruitment consultants. In other words, you'd do your research. You'd have to lie. You'd have to say oh. I'm from such and such, and I, I refused to do that. Mm. So in the year, in the ten months I was there, I only made one sale. And my manager, lovely guy Martin, you know, he pre-warned me. He said, "Harun, you're not getting the business in. Mm. Um, you know, you'll be asked to move soon, leave soon. So you know, you might want to sort yourself out." Yes. So I did. Um, lovely guy, and uh, ended up getting another medical sales job. Um, in um, based in Birmingham and um, in the year 2001 moved there my son was a year old and uh, thankfully I went back into medical sales and I stayed there until 2003 until I started my own business um, and in the time though I also got separated my second son was born that that although on the face of it which is a shortly afterwards you met me on the face of it I was successful deep inside the divorce was killing me. Yes. Of course. Because I guess there's a sense of failure there. Yeah. And with yeah. all of the successes that you've had on your journey, that that's one that really, really gets, you know, I think it's, it's more, it's tougher on guys, I think, even mm. than it is on, on the girls. It, it is, it is, because we don't, as men, we do not know fully how to express our emotions. Mm. And the highest suicide rate is amongst men, particularly particularly in their 40s. Okay, I was 33 by the time, or well, 32 by the time I separated. P men of a certain age who are estranged from their family and they've got children. Highest suicide rate amongst them was there. And... There were times where I'd be driving down, I was still doing medical sales at the time when I separated, where I would travel to, say, South End on Sea, working on one of the South End General Hospital, um, leaving the house five in the morning and for about four hours driving down, in fact, 4.30 in the morning, four hours driving down, crying all the way down. Yes. Going to the hospital, into the bathroom, into the toilets, washing my face in the sink, cleaning myself up, going in there, putting on that professional face. Coming back out after a day's work, jumping in the car, this is about November uh, 2002, driving all the way back, crying all the way back, uh, you know, screaming at God, the universe, whoever, hoping I'd get knocked over by a lorry and killed, basically. That happened on a daily basis. That is, um, you know, we often look at people's successes and we look at our faces. And I'm a classic example of a guy, alpha male, who knows how to put a good face on, but deep inside, literally dying inside, hoping to die. Um, we're very good at that. And that's an area that perhaps needs a lot more attention. I know there's one or two organizations who are trying their best, but the suicide rate amongst men is still far too high. And it, it's interesting because I, I listened to a podcast the other day um, on the 10% Happier podcast by Dan Harris, and he was interviewing Lewis House. Oh, yes, yes. And Lewis Howes has this whole story about him, but he 
and, and about how he was hiding behind the masculine mask. And he's written a book called The Mask of Masculinity. Wow. And because, and it all, did, I mean, I haven't read it, but I can well imagine it describes exactly what you are describing, that right, as right. men, we put on a mask of masculinity and we push through and eventually it does catch up with us in some way or another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the, as a child, growing up as a child, you've got a, a, a with a backdrop. I, I grew up, I came from another country, Bangladesh, grew up in Britain, um, religious background, even though I'm not religious, my parents are super and were back then super religious, sure. uh, cultural background. We didn't even, the concept of divorce was there in Islam. Mm. But uh, it, when I grew up in Birmingham, in the area called Aston, near Villa Park, um, we there was one couple who were divorced, and everybody knew about it. Divorce was not a concept that people were used to. And so my worst nightmare would have been a divorce, and that's exactly what happened. That was my worst nightmare, and I manifested it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a bit of a down, downward trend there, a bit of a low point, and we all get them. Um, Absolutely. And then, but so what decided you then to start your own business, and what was it? that you decided okay. to do. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to deal with the down point first. First of all is me getting divorced was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. And it was the worst thing. It's something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. But get this, it's the best thing that happened. You see, I worked like crazy. And I was one trying to build this business up as well. So I was networking like crazy. And I had two young baby boys and um, who are now not so young and baby and they're like 18 and 16 at the time of recording. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't get to spend so much time very close to my you know kids. Um, but as a result of the divorce, I ended up with them 65, 70% of the time when I was living in Birmingham, they were with me. It forced me because they were so young, it forced me to give them full attention. Yes. Now, the relationship I have with them is so amazing. If I wasn't me, I'd be jealous of me as a dad. <laughs> That's the kind of relationship I have. Seriously, they are, they're, they're, they're more like parents to me. They care for me, as I care for them, obviously. Yes. They care for me. They, you know, they, they, every now and again, they'd turn around randomly and say something like, you know what, Abu, Abu means dad, you inspire me because of blah, blah, blah. They did, for example, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a while. And then one of my sons turned to me and said, now that he knows how tough it is, he said, I really, really, uh, I'm inspired by all that you've done in martial arts and uh, primarily because I was a British kickboxing champion at some point yes. and, um, you know, how you work through it, et cetera. Um, so, so there is a massive upside. Yes. Had I been married still and I went down that trajectory, I probably end, would have ended up divorced anyway. Let's pretend we never did that. I'd probably be ending up looking very old. I wouldn't have met you, amazing you, and amazing people that we know. Yes. Um, there's so many things in my life that have happened in a good way, in a phenomenal way. I wouldn't be doing had it. And but most importantly, I wouldn't have the relationship that I have with my son. So actually, sometimes, in fact, very often, our worst tragedies to ourselves personally may end up being the biggest blessings. And it's so important to find the blessing in every tragedy. Now, to answer the rest of the question, what, what's made me set up my own business? Very simple. I, my father's an entrepreneur. I'd seen him, you know, um, do things to better himself constantly. It wasn't about the money. It was about how can I make better my situation, my family situation, make a bigger difference. And so when I, when I'd first moved away from medical and into recruitment, I wanted to actually set up my own business, but I just held back. And But there was the universe pushed me because the company that I worked for, the last company I worked for, they, even though I was the top performer by far, um, they didn't like the fact, they knew, they somehow knew I didn't work that many hours. Even though everyone else got less than 100% of every, you know, their target every month, I'd get 120%, 130% a month. They still didn't like. They were, They didn't like me, basically, and so they were constantly on my case. And I won't go into that too much. Um, but in the end, I thought, forget it. I might as well do my own thing. It was and a little also, push. Yeah, it was a little it, push. It, it was that. That was one of the push. And the and the other push was, you know, 
how am I going to spend more time with my kids? Yes. If I'm working in a full time job, if I am expected to work nine till five or eight till six or whatever. So the, it was two, two, uh, two or three key reasons why I moved. And my first business was coaching people and training them in sales because guess what? I was good at sales. Yes. OK, so you became a sales trainer effectively. Yeah. Yes, yes. OK, but I wasn't a, but I wasn't a good one. I'll tell you why <laughs> um, <laughs> I wasn't good. I was good at what I did. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people wanted total breakdown of how you do the sale. Mm. And this is when I met shortly afterwards. I met David Heiner, who, you know, yes. and we set up something called the GIS Sales Club, which is Get Incredible Sales. And he asked me a very important question. Haroon, what's your process when you sell? I, said, I don't have a process. Mm. But how the hell do you do it? I don't know. I, I connect with them. They like me. They trust me. I ask them lots of questions. Then they buy from me. But what about when they say no? They rarely say no. <laughs> 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 I always give them an offer that they can't resist. <laughs> so, so, but it's actually important to understand a lot of entrepreneurs, two things they don't get. Number one, without sales, you don't have a business. You have a hobby. Number one, very important, because every other function of your business, marketing, operations, finance, all of that is costing you money. The only thing that brings you money is sales. That's the first thing. Number two, sales does not have to be complicated. It really doesn't. It truly is about getting someone to know you, like you, trust you, engage with you, and then you offer them something that they need, that they want, and that they value. And that comes through the point that I made earlier on about asking lots of good quality questions. Yeah. That's the trick. And, and that's the bit that people don't know. They don't know to ask those questions, basically. Correct. Yeah. OK, so sales training. How long did you do that for? Well, so I did that for from 2003 until 2007. So. During this time, by the way, my I was getting into I'd never been in debt. I was getting more and more debt, primarily because constant having to fight to see the kids, mm. even though, you know, we always had the same kind of uh, schedule. It was constantly that. And that was eating away at my soul. Number one. Number two, this is not making excuses. This is just facts. Number two, for the first time working in an environment where I was the only person really working uh, in the sense that I didn't have that support structure. I didn't have in a company organi organizational structure, you usually have some kind of support. When you, so I, most people have make this mistake that they're good at something and then they set their own business, not realizing they've got to do lots of other things. So I was very good at selling and I had to be, training was, I was good at that as well. I was an award-winning trainer by now. Mm. Um, so I can deliver the training, I can do the sales, but then the admin and the e not the emails, the letters and the finance, all that kind of stuff started just wearing me down. So I was ending doing up all the stuff that I don't like and less of the stuff that I was really good at. So by 2007, I got into such severe debt. I was actually depressed, but I didn't know it at the time because on the face of it, I convinced myself I was happy. Yes. I convinced myself I was confident. I certainly, I think, I'm sure I met you at the Yes Group at the time in Birmingham, where people are asking about wealth and law of attraction. And I'm, you know, they assumed I was, you know, I knew about it because I used to dress impeccably. Mm. <laughs> and uh, But inside, I was like thinking, what a fake. So by then, um, I had to, I got in so much debt I was one month away from eviction, so I lost my property that I was renting. Um, I had two cars because I used to be in a, with a partner at a point. I bought her a car as well. Both of the cars were repossessed. And had it not been for my family in Leicester, I would have been homeless. So 2007 was another pivotal moment. And what, in that time, I was also, I'd lost my interest in teaching sales because I was thinking, so what? What if I teach somebody how to sell a widget? What difference are they making to the world? So this thing was recurring in my mind that how can one individual, if I teach them, train them or myself, change in such a way that they can have a global transformation? Mm. So I started delving into the worlds of uh, metaphysics, quantum physics, stuff like um, the secret had come out and stuff like another movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? Yes. And so 
I I just binged on YouTube videos, watching and learning and trying to really comprehend. And also movies like uh, Zeitgeist, because Zeitgeist was all about the global picture, um, societal, the macro. S- um, the Secret was all about me, 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 mm. bottom line, really. And I thought, okay, there must be a middle ground somewhere where I can take care of me and make a difference, as opposed to, hey, let's give up everything and make, change the world, or um, let's just look after me. So I in I got involved in that, and I went to quite a few seminars, and I ended up in a business partnership at the time, teaching something, co- co-teaching, something called the Law of Intention Experience, which is really much more powerful than Law of Attraction. Did that for a year. We used that process to raise money and then build a school in Sierra Leone, and which was at the time the most poorest country in the world. And But then the partnership didn't work because the individual I was were, with had a different trajectory, let's put it that way, to the way I wanted to go. I wanted to transform the world. I wanted other people to get involved. And so by 2008, I started interviewing people for the first time on, uh, well, 2007 I started. Um, I did a stint with BBC Radio. I did teleseminars, podcasts now, obviously, they call that. But then by 2008, I started doing my show called the Consciousness, Consciousness Revolution Show. How do we create a revolution in consciousness? So I was interviewing scientists and metaphysicists in the field of consciousness so that I can understand the, science, the synergy between science and spirituality. That went really well. That really had a major impact, but it didn't pay me the wages. No. It was not a very good business. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I kept myself going because I was mentoring people, um, entrepreneurs in particular, and particularly in sales, and I started healing people. It was a long story. You asked for my life story. It's taking longer than I thought. <laughs> yeah, it always does. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So... I did that for quite a while. I even set up a radio station called Untangled FM where we had up to about, I don't know, at some point we had about, I'm sure we had about 10 presenters, 10 shows running. And it was all people talking about different elements of global transformation, so including a vegan show. Um, another one was um, about, uh, I'm trying to think what other shows there were now. There's loads of shows. That's all I can think of right now. Oh, yeah, relationships and so on. So there's a whole bunch of shows. And... Now, going back to relationships, way back, 2002, I separated, and I kept having relationships that started and stopped. And then by 2013, I was in a relationship, lasted less than a year, and I was really heartbroken, not because of her, but because of the fact that I could never sustain a relationship. I thought, oh my goodness, it's like all these women who meet me, um, they they know all my raw nerves all my hot buttons to press to upset me it's like they meet my ex-wife and they uh, they convene together and she tells them all the secrets and i thought what's the common theme between these women and i thought oops i'm the common theme of course so yes yeah, so i turned to a lot of therapists psychotherapists healers all sorts of people to see if i can change the cause of my problem not the symptoms the cause yes nobody could help me i really couldn't so i intuitively started working on me and before you know it, I started getting results, such phenomenal results, <laughs> such phenomenal results that I ended up being bedridden for a month. In other words, I was detoxing on an emotional level so hard, so intensely that I fell ill. Mm. When I say I fell ill, I was, uh, thankfully, I was with family. I, I was in a bed for a month. I barely could walk uh, to the bathroom and back. Thank you know, had it not been for family, I probably would have starved to death. Yes. But then after a month, everything shifted. For the first time, Michael, in my life, I was happy in my own skin. I didn't have attachments to wanting a relationship, wanting money, wanting anything. I'd surrendered even to life itself. For the first time since I was probably about five or six years old, I was happy, I was confident in my own skin. And then my world changed. Now, I've taught that to many people. I've held retreats, etc. But today, what I do is this. I realize that we all have gifts and we all have strengths. My gift is connecting people. My gift is collaborating with them. And my gift is helping them and helping myself to tap into the greatest level of creativity. So today, what I do is I help CEOs, business owners of fast-growing organizations, so 10-plus organizations, um, 
who truly want to be influential and impactful on the world. And how we work that is really getting them to understand how they make decisions. So you are the sum of all the decisions you make. All your micro decisions, not the big ones that count, it's the micro ones, have landed you where you are right now, every other listener right now. You change the way you decide, then you will find your life changes as well. It's like going to the gym. You can't go to the gym. You can't make a decision now and go to the gym, say, okay, I'm going to the gym today and tomorrow you're going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It doesn't work like that. It's constant micro-training on a daily basis or every alternate daily basis that changes you. So same with the decision-making muscles. As you start shifting your decisions, most of them, by the way, are driven by internal stuff, primarily childhood. As you start changing that, you see your reality will change. You will see your life will change. Brilliant. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know you are short on time, so we're probably... There's so much more that I want to ask you about that, but maybe we need to have a second one and go in a yeah. bit more depth about like, what you do today. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 I'll tell you what, I'm happy to share. Let's do another one because I'm happy to, because the whole decision-making thing, uh, work that I do now, is the culmination of all my life experiences and knowledge and the science that I've collected. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, it's really, you know, you are one decision away you really are one decision away from your massive breakthrough. Yes. But people don't understand or really don't understand what decision mean making means. There's a lot more than meets the eye. That's all I geek out on, by the way. All the books that I read, yes. and I read at least one book a week, all the books that I read, all the scientific research and neuroscience I study um, uh, through you know, reading papers, etc., all of them are just purely based on decision making. Mm. And we literally are, every, whether you're in a relational situation or your business situation, you're one good decision away from transforming that relationship, that business. Well, let's, let's end it there. And let's, <laughs> let's do a second one, definitely. Okay. Uh, but before you go, just share with us, where can people find you? I'll put it in the show notes anyway. OK, uh, just just say verbally the best places for people to find you. OK, so, so the best place to find me is through my website, HaroonRabbani.com. And I'm on all, all, all the good social media sites. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. If you're an entrepreneur, get me through LinkedIn. I'll, I take people business. When it comes to business, LinkedIn is the serious place for me. So, yeah, all, all, all the good social medias. And if you Google me, it's very easy to track me down. Okay. I'm very easy to find. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I will send you an invite to do a second one and we can go into a little bit more depth about decision making because that sounds just absolutely spot on. Oh, it's, um, I, I tell you what, it, it's if people can get this, this is my life's work. Uh, and it's not about me. This is my life's work in terms of my, from childhood, I really, having grown up in poverty, having grown up in racially, intensely racist areas, um, <clears throat> dealt with domestic violence, all that kind of stuff. I've learned a lot along the way. And this is like the culmination of all the, it's a distillation of all the knowledge that can help people change their life rapidly. I hope that's enough of a taster for people to come back. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> we'll de definitely get them curious, that's for sure. Haroon, next time you're in Birmingham, please let me know and I'll, I'll buy you a coffee. And, uh, <laughs> Is that all? Is that all? You're just buying me? Okay, maybe yeah, lunch. Maybe lunch. L l there you go. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> really okay, great to speak to you and thank you so much for sharing your story. Okay, thank you very much. Speak to you soon. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.